And I'd like you to turn to that. It's Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Matthew 11, verse 28. Sometimes when we go through adversity, we feel like we're alone. And that's where despair comes along. But when Jesus speaks here in, in, in Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28, about come to me, notice what he said, come unto me. And you say, who? Well, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come unto me. So for those of you who say, well, I, I, I would try to process it, I try to, or I just sit back, or just take a step back and try to uh, figure out my next um, course of action. For those of you who responded, well, the first thing I do, your automatic response is, I pray. I think that's the best way. Because the Lord says, you know, I'm here to help. Come unto me, he says. And of course, we go unto him when, the, when trials don't seem to have a solution. There are some trials we feel that we can solve at home. Uh, things that break, and you say, well, I can handle that. Until they break more in your own hands. Then you find, try to, uh, then maybe you want to sit down and, and ask for help. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Was, you know, you're, un you're under the weight of that labor, the, the working of that trial in your heart. And he says, I will give you rest. Now, this is a very simple text, but how do you do it? When you, when you go to him, then what? How do you, when you deal with adversity, how do you deal with this? Now, it's interesting when you ask people about what, how they deal with adversity, they say, Well, oh, I pray. And they ask them, Why do you pray? So that God will remove it. But did you ever think that maybe God put that trial there so that He can uh, develop us in our character, in our dependence on Him, in, a, in, in an awakening? I found that story. I found this story about years, many years ago, and it's it stuck to my heart. Let me share it with you. It was a story. It, it, basically, this is a true story. Uh, years ago, a, a, a woman with a little boy was riding in a stagecoach. Remember, remember Tim, when you oh, used yes, to ride yes. those? Yeah. <laughs> Since my brother Clay is not here, I have to get pick up somebody. Stagecoach in Western Montana. I don't know if you've ever been there. I've never been there, but when you watch the videos, the, the landscape just goes on and on. It's endless. And in winter, it probably has the, hard, the hardest, most difficult weather in the winter. Well, this is a story. It says, the weather was so bitter cold, and in spite of all the driver could do, to protect her, he saw that the mother was becoming unconscious from the cold. So he stopped the coach, took the baby, and wrapping it in warmly, put it under the seat, and then seized the mother by the arm, and dragging her out upon the ground, drove away, leaving her on the road. Good idea. How many of you would say that's the best course of action? How many of you would say, what was that coach driver thinking about? What, what kind of method is this in order to help this situation? Well, as she saw him drive away, she ran after him, crying uh, piteously for her, ba for her baby. When he, uh, when he felt sure that she was warm again, he <laughs> allowed her to overtake the coach and resume her place by her baby. He could not, uh, can, you know, when you hear a story like this, you say, how would that woman be thankful to that coast driver? She was actually saving, he was actually saving her life. And by saving her life, she, he was saving her baby's life. So it wasn't like, well, let me warm you up. It's like you, you need to move. You need to do something. You need to get out of this uh, dormant state and and move your, your your the members of your body warm and you to come back uh, so you know your, your your blood would start warming up. So instead of screaming to the uh, uh, how do you say stage, stage coach. coach coach stage coach. he she thanked 
thanked him. She realized what, she, what he was, it was very difficult for this man to do something like that. But he did this understanding that he was probably the only thing he could do in that situation. Do you think the Lord might do that to us sometimes? Where he sees that, you know, we're just going dormant, we're just becoming, we're dying away, and he needs to bring something drastic in order to wake us up, get us moving again, get us back on our feet, get the blood uh, flowing in our veins. Sometimes I think, especially in the days in which we live, we can become very spiritually dormant. And the Lord might bring us <coughs> to the trials, and we think, well, what do I do? And we try to rationalize, we try to uh, find a strategy, We're, we, 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 we try to put a solution to it, when all the time the Lord just wants us to go to Him and say, Lord, help me understand what you're trying to do. We have several passages in Scripture that can help us understand this, that teaches us why the Lord sometimes allows even devastating trials come into our life. I remember, for example, Job 14, 1, it, it says, Man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. Thank you very much, Lord. Or Job chapter 5, verse 7, Yet man is born unto trouble, and the sparks fly upward. You find even Jesus speaking about that in John chapter 16, verse 33, where it says, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In this world you should have tribulation. But, I'm sure glad for that but there, but be of good cheer. Uh, smile, uh, you're not alone. He said, I have overcome the world. So you have burdens, you have troubles, you have trials, you have difficulties, difficulties, and when they come, you know, I normally get phone calls when these things happen in the church. Uh, things are going okay, nobody remembers the call, but things, when they go south, Pastor, please, I need, I need help. It might be financial help because they put, they made bad decisions, maybe it's a marital um, trouble that they're going through, or kind of problems with their kids, uh, you know, maybe all the problems can be of all kinds, and, uh, and they expect, of course, the pastor to have a magical solution. And I always have to be humble about this. I say, you know, all I can do is listen and turn you over to the Lord, because He is the one that has the solution. <coughs> I looked up this man called Felix Neff. He was a, a theologian, a, 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 a philanthropist, and he also was a, a military man in his youth, in his younger years. Uh, he lived in the 18th century, and he said something that, in one phrase I think puts it all together, it says, a Christian without affliction is like a soldier only on parade. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, we all like to wear our suits on parade. I did that when I was in the military service. And you like the, everybody looking to you like you're a hero. But when you're in the, uh, in the battle line, you never had, never had to do that. But, you know, things don't look the same way. How do we respond to adversity? I titled this message, How to Handle What's Handling You. And that is to re recognize Sometimes what's really going on in your life and how you are to deal with it. Again, many Christians simply pray like Paul was a pray when he tried to remove the thorn in his flesh. Lord, remove this. I can do better without this. I can serve you much better without this. And the Lord said, no. Uh, he prayed again and the Lord responded the same way. Three times the Lord said, no. He says, I have something better for you. I'm going to leave it with you. And I'm going to be your sufficiency throughout your life. I have three points for you. What do you do when adversity comes? What's handling you? Well, listen, first of all, take your burdens to the right place. It's good to have a mentor. Have good people to that you can talk to about it openly. People who have some experience. Well, that's very important. But I hope you find that God is supposed to you know, be the first one. So take your burdens to the first place. The second thing, 
Transfer your burdens to the right person. The Lord said, come to me and I will. I will lighten up your burden. Sometimes he might say, well, I'm going to leave it with you, but I'm going to stay with you. I'm going to carry it with you. So transfer your burdens to the right person and then trust your burdens to the right provisions. And I'll explain what I mean by that. So let's have a word of prayer and ask the Lord to bless us. It's not going to be a long message. I'm going to be short at each point. But I hope you take note of this because you never know. Maybe as soon as you walk out of this building, maybe as soon as I walk out of this building, something might just break. You know, I'll be praising the Lord this summer because last summer we had over six or seven breakages in the church. And this year it's all been wonderful. No breakages, we've been repairing many things, the church is looking wonderful, everything's dry. That for me is a blessing in itself. And then we have air conditioning. If you don't appreciate that, I'm going to have you listen from the outside the window. You know, when you have all these things coming up, and they're all coming up at the same time, that's when you say, I'm drowning, I don't know what to do. That your first response will probably be a, a carnal response. You should have seen me when I had the last leak uh, here. Uh, I think it was uh, in the sink, somebody had left it running. And of course the water was... And I thought, I'm going to call the administrator, I'm going to read it. And it wasn't the administrator's fault, it wasn't the community, it was our fault. One of the members of the church simply forgot to close the tap. And that brought a lot of trouble. But my first response is that, Sammy, there you are again. <laughs> that old enemy inside of you is responding, blaming people. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we need you this afternoon. We need you to help us process this verse that you gave us in, uh, in Matthew chapter 11. It's such a simple verse. Come unto me. It means, first of all, that we not need to trust you. It means also that you have control. And maybe it also means that you might not want to remove the problem, but want to remain in there so that we can count on walking closer to you. There's many ways, Lord, many reasons why you can bring adversity, why you, why you can allow adversity, trials and tribulations to come our way. And I pray, Lord, as we go through this message, we will uh, learn how to process uh, difficulty. As I said before, we're, we might be doing one really nice, well, we might, might be doing very well right now, but who knows what's going to happen tomorrow. And if we don't take note, if we don't listen, uh, and don't uh, learn from this, Lord. We might fail the test. So I pray that your spirit will take over, Lord, give me the words that I need and, and give us the understanding that we also need in order to grow through this. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. First point is take your burdens to the right place. Now, there's certain ways that you can respond. First of all, there's people who just worry to death. And since I want to put every, every one of these points under the same letter, I put fleeting won't help you. Did you notice that people, here, uh, at least here in the Costa del Sol, when they have problems, they just want to book a, 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 cruise, a cruise somewhere. They just want to get away. I noticed that in Christmas, it's becoming more common for people to just avoid Christmas and just get a cruise and go away for two, three weeks. Because it just brings them... Uh, many old bad memories. They, they just want to run away from the situation. Most people take their burdens here to this area we call Worry City. And uh, we worry ourselves sick. It's interesting how Paul deals with this. In Philippians chapter 4, 6, it says, Be careful for nothing. If uh, Clay would be here, he likes to uh, play tricks on us. It says, What? does nothing mean. I think when the Lord said, be careful for nothing, it means nothing, zero. Be careful, don't be worrying yourself about everything, but in everything, in everything, so those of you who responded, the first thing I do, I go to the Lord. I try to speak it out to Him, I try to process it, I give it to Him, and then ask Him to help me deal with it. He says, be careful for nothing, but in everything, by power, and notice now, you don't, don't just leave it there, it says, and supplication with thanksgiving. The problem is not that it disappeared yet. You still have reasons to worry, but instead of worrying, you thank the Lord. Amen. 
Thank you very much, Pastor. Let your request be known unto God. Thanksgiving. How about responding with Thanksgiving? How many of you have responded? I mean, be honest about it. When a trial comes and it hits you really hard, you say, I don't know what's going on, but Lord, I thank you. I don't know where this is going, but it's going to break me, but I, I still thank you because I trust you with it. By saying, don't worry about it, but pray about it and be thankful about it. It says, make sure you bring it all to him. Be sure to bring it all to him. In John chapter 14, 1, it says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. If you remember the story with uh, Martha and Mary back in Luke chapter 10, who was the one that worried herself sick, trying to make sure that everything was, you know, perfectly in its place, Every, that, that Jesus Christ was being treated like the Lord he was. One of the two sisters sat by the Lord's seat, and Jesus talked to Martha, she said, Martha, 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 you were so worried, you were so concerned about everything, where at this moment, what you should be doing is sitting with your sister, listening to what I have to say, because later on you're gonna need it. Learn to read the story. So people respond by worrying away, you know, fleeting, you know, running away from the situation, like you can leave the problem behind. You know what happens after the cruise, you still have the problem, but then you have your credit card <laughs> Uh, in red numbers. When you say, well, no, I wouldn't do that. I have friends. Some of you responded, I try to go to those people that I trust. But sometimes they, don't, they can't help you. They can only give you advice. The problem's still there. So friends might not be able to help you. You know, Joe can t tell us a lot about friends when he came with all the problems. What did he do? He, he told them, this is what he told them in, in Job 13, 4, it says, But you are fortress of lies, you are of all physicians of no value. It's like going to the doctor, you know, thinking that he might give you a solution, and you have, you know, a really bad problem, and it's something that an aspirin would not fix, and the, and the doctor says, take this after the meal, an aspirin. When Joe opened up to his friends, his friends didn't digest, didn't, uh, didn't have the right theology, and they, and they bombarded him with all kind of criticism. You, you, the problem, you, you, you think you're so just? The problem you have is really sin, hidden sin in your life. God would not allow anybody to go through this unless there was sin in you. And for almost 30 chapters, you have Joe's three friends and one that was kind of hearing it, and caught on at the, at the end, all saying the same thing. And Job calls them forgers of life. You don't, you're not understanding what's really going on. You're dealing with a problem in the wrong way. So you might have friends, and you know, they are sincere, but they can be sincerely wrong in the interpretation of your situation. I've had a friend, a friend people like that. Where you were just, you know, going through some burden, you had something that you were not able to digest well, and you needed somebody with more experience that you could talk to, and and they somehow related that with something that they experienced that had nothing to do with what I was going through, and they give you the wrong diagnosis. Well, Joe would say to that, "You are um, like." Um, physicians of no value. You, you, you really don't have a solution. You can't really tell me what's going on. So you might, have, you might have friends and praise the Lord for friends. Praise the Lord for those who have experienced walking with the Lord for many, many years and have gone through trials and have, have been victors, have been successful going through those situations. Maybe they went through loss of dear uh, family members, uh, uh, children, uh, maybe went through times of uh, financial need where they didn't have anybody there to help them out. I've come across some missionaries who were, they were in the mission field, were, went through situations that would have broken me in pieces. And they managed to hold on and, 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 and bloom out of those situations. I need to say, I need to have people like that around me. In Proverbs 27, 6, it says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend. What? 
But the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Did you know that a real friend is someone who tells you the truth even if it rips you apart? Read that again. Faithful are the wounds. A friend, a real friend will tell you the truth. And you might hurt us. And sometimes when they do that, when they hurt us, they do it. I thought you were my friend. Well, I can lie to you. This is what you want me to do. But I wouldn't be your friend then. A real friend tells you the truth, even if it hurts you. We need to be ready for that. Also, a fleeting won't help you. Friends might not be able to help you. How about uh, fleeing won't help you? You want to run away. You worry. You got your friends, but now you just you just want to run away. I have an interesting story from a woman called Patricia Christie. She fled to. Florida to avoid Hurricane Andrew. You remember that one? 1992? Hurricane Andrew. I know what I'm going to do. This, uh, I'm used to uh, hurricanes. I'm not going to go through this one. So she took a plane, the first plane to Hawaii, and arrived there just when Typhoon Iniki hit. <laughs> I'll run away from the, from the problem. Only to run into one that's more, probably even more severe. And then you have the one fighting. Fighting won't help you either. A lot of people try to live in denial. And they fight. They try to blame others for things that are happening to them. Fighting against what the Lord brings might be very dangerous. So I think it's interesting that we understand, first of all, you know, the nature of this problem. And we understand also, try to understand what the Lord is trying to do. He, you know, with Brother Eddie, we just received a wonderful letter from Brother Eddie. I posted it on the WhatsApp. And I remember talking to him many times when he was still with us. And I said, what do you do when you have trials? I said, I pray my heart out. When I get sick, I said, stay in bed and all I do is pray, confessing the sins that I did and never committed. <laughs> just in case. <laughs> uh, I said, what do you do? Why do you do I said, because I don't know where the problem is. I don't know why I'm in the, situ the situation I'm, I'm in. It might be something that's internal. Instead of fighting back against something, I need to understand if I'm producing the problem. So fighting won't help you either. Especially fighting against God. You know, the Lord brings trials into our life only to expose the carnal nature, the carnal, the sinful nature that we tend to be, uh, be, uh, behave. You know who's going to help you? The Father will help you. In Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, it says, Come unto me. Who? All who labor and are heavy laden. The Lord throws an open door to us. An open door really to His throne. It's not just any place, come up to me, to the throne of grace. The place where God would say, Son, how can I help you? I'm ready to help you. I'm ready to... Uh, but most of all, Lord, it, 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 He tries to help us understand where we need to be. Because we might not be walking the right way with the Lord. He invites us to come with our needs to Him. In Hebrews chapter 4, 16, it says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in, in time of need. Come boldly. Don't shy away. Don't run away from the Lord. You know, when there's maybe if you found that it's sin that's causing the problem, don't, don't delay it. Come to the Lord as soon as you can, as soon as possible. It, you know, sometimes I preach, sometimes... I preach on this subject and, and people just kind of leave it without and noticing that they have a problem. You can assess that they have a problem, a sinful kind of behavior, and instead of dealing with it right there, they just move on, hoping that uh, it won't create any more problems. Um, this is a very tender verse in Luke chapter 12, verse 32, where the Lord says, Fear not, little flock. For it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It's the first expression, the first sentence, fear not, little flock. You just think of that for a moment. He's looking, he's the, 
the creator of the universe looking at this at us one of the problems that I had before I was saved I thought the Lord was far far away if it did exist it was very impersonal when I got to know the Lord as my personal Savior I understood that I was very special to him it took me a while to process that I'm special to him that he really loves me you know sometimes it can be take years to understand that I had a missionary you probably you remember brother Bob Semeski came years ago a missionary from Ireland I, I received a letter he was a missionary for over 50 years tremendous theologian I could sit under his teaching for hours he had such wisdom but he came about 30 about 20 some years after we met he said Sammy I've just realized one thing I'm so excited the Lord loves me I said it's only taking you 40 years to understand that he says I always knew it but I had a problem dealing with it in a personal way of course if you understood his background you know that his father never did love him and always pushed him away and that had an effect on him and when he finally understood that God loved him with tender love his whole character changed but he, so here in Luke chapter 12 32 he says fear not my little flock for it is your father's good pleasure it is my pleasure to help you to give you the kingdom and then in Psalm 23 how many of you know Psalm 23 by memory what a psalm the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want what do you mean by I shall not want that with him I'll, that's all I need he covers every situation and every need that I have I shall not want he maketh me <clears throat> lie down in green pastures it's talking about me he leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. Oh, I need restoration. How many of you need restoration? I need the Lord to restore me every day. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, that's your trials. I will fear no evil. Why? Because thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me. Lord, you, 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 you have, you know, what I need. And what, what do I do with the enemies? He'll take care of them, he says. Psalm 23, it's always a wonderful song to remember. I remember Brother Eddie. Let me get tell you, this is a funny one. There was a, an English friend who had to go to the hospital. And uh, they told Eddie about... Uh, him being uh, very sick and so he went to the hospital and when he got into the room he felt he, he, he seemed like he was sleeping and uh, he started reading Psalm 23 and the, and the man opened his eyes in panic thinking that it was it was dying because that's what you read in the deathbed of some people it says no this is this is a comforting song it's not something so that a psalm is not a song a song that would put you in panic he said his eyes opened up and he started wondering maybe if he was already gone just reading psalm 23 you know and, and he went through some incredible experiences when he told me about them i always had always cracked up so take your burdens to the right place next transfer the burdens to the right person who is the right person he is the one that cares about your situation. First Peter 5, 7 says, Jesus was, has walked through, um, I'm sorry, it says, cast all your cares upon him, for he careth for you. Cast all your cares upon him. So instead of worrying yourself sick, instead of blaming others, instead of running away from the problem, make sure you go to the right place. He has... Uh, he's been hated, he's been uh, loved, he, uh, he was rejected. He understands our situation. This is what Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 talks about. When we go to the Lord, is he, he's someone that can relate with our burdens. In Hebrews 4, 15, he says, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He understands. Jesus understands. But was in all points tempted like us and like as we are yet without sin 
Have you ever gone to your wife and said, honey, I have something I need to tell you, but I don't think you're going to understand. No, I better not. She says, well, come on, honey, let me know. No, you're not going to understand. Says, uh, no, forget it. Sometimes wives say, I feel the same way with the Lord. It says, bring it on. I understand. I understand better than you what you're going through. He knows what you need even before you, you know it. And two, there is one who can do something about your situation. I love your answer, Brother Tim. But, you know, I, I doubt that your uh, Brother Bob will always be able to solve the problem. <coughs> He's got some very wise uh, family members in his gang that he can go to. But there's sometimes even Dad, who is 96 and knows everything, can solve. It's wonderful to have believers that you can trust. Maybe a husband or wife that you can lean on. Maybe a pastor who might be able to understand because he's gone through some situations. But you know, at the end, at the end of the day, they, might, they don't have the solution. They can give you some advice. They can pray for you. They can even talk to the rest of the congregation and say, hey, bro, let's, let's pray for this individual. He's going through one of those really testy trials. Let's pray that he comes through. The Lord says, I can help. We can go to him. And I think this is probably the most important point in this message. He can do something. He has the power. He has the understanding. He has the wisdom. You have several passages that talk about this. In Ephesians 3.20 says, Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundant abundantly above all that we ask and think. You think he can do something better? He can do even more than you, uh, than you could ever imagine. According to the power that worketh in us. In Job 42, 2, it says, I know that thou canst do everything. That's very good in King James English, meaning you can do anything, Lord. And that no thought can be withholden from thee. You know, every, have you ever tried to pray not really understanding what, you're, what you need to pray for? You're going through this burden, you're going through this, you know, you know, this situation you don't even understand how to deal with, and you try to pray and the words don't come out. Aren't you happy that the Holy Spirit translates your thoughts and brings them in order before the Lord? He says, He understands, even though you do not, do not understand. In, I think it's in Romans chapter 8 where it says that the Holy Spirit intercedes for us with um, unspeakable groanings. In Luke chapter 138 it says, And Mary said, Behold thy handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Even Mary said, Lord, you know what's going on, you know what I need. So take your burdens to the right place. Amen. Take, I mean, transfer your burdens to the right person. And then third, and I'll try to explain this one, trust your burdens to the right provisions. Now, three things here, and I think I'll clarify that. Sometimes he will remove the problem. Isn't that wonderful when you pray and you're in panic and the Lord just simply says, okay, come on. There are times when the Lord changes the situation drastically. It's there and then all of a sudden it's disappeared. And this is what we expect the Lord to do all the time, right? Simply remove the problem. Lord, I'll be happy if you just get this problem out of the way. The Lord says, okay, I'm going to get it out of the way. And as simple as it came, it goes away. Now, that would be a wonderful thing if it happened that way. But sometimes the Lord says, no, I'm going to leave it with you for a while. So he might remove the, bur the burden. Sometimes he will relieve the burden. In other words, he won't take it away. He will carry it with you. I mentioned the name of Ivan Augsburger this morning. He was a teacher in seminary, a man that is with the Lord right now. He was a German-born, American-raised missionary who went to Latin America for 50 years, came back to the United States, and uh, he thought that retirement was a good, uh, good idea to go to Madrid and help for about three or four years in the seminary. I had him as a teacher. He was about seven, close to 80 years old then. 
strong German, you know, big, you know, uh, German guy, white hair, full hair, full hair, headed hair, you know, he was, and uh, he says, hey, when I went to this country, I forgot the country, it was so many years ago, he says, there was always in the fields, you see the oxen plowing, and, they, and you see sometimes the old oxen and the younger oxen, and they're one of those yokes over them, and he says, those I would watch those animals and I learned so much from them, especially when I compared them with Scripture. When the Lord says, I will carry the yoke with you. He says, sometimes when the young ox was just beaten up because of the plowing all day long, this, the heavier stock, um, heavier oxen, you know, would, would kind of go like this with his, with his neck and, and lift up the yoke so that the, the fresh air would go through underneath the, the yoke. I thought maybe that was a, an accident, that was just a coincidence, but I saw that they did this on, on and on again. Somehow the older oxen who was much stronger understood the way that this younger ox was going through and would do this, oh, I'll raise it with it, but he wouldn't, wouldn't take it away. And you say, Lord, that's exactly, that's exactly what you do with me every day. He doesn't remove it. He relieves you. He, he, he relieves your burden. And, you know, we see a very interesting example of that with Ruth and Boaz. Remember, Boaz is a picture, gives us a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. But Boaz didn't remove the problem. He helped her through that. There's a wonderful story of redemption in the book. So, in the book of Ruth, please read it. But you'll see how the Lord sometimes uh, allows us to grow through difficulty, only to test us. And the third thing, sometimes He will rest you in your burden. And this is the most common aid that we will receive from Him. In 2 Corinthians 12, 9, it says, And He said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Are you sure, Lord? Is this what you're trying to do with me? Making me understand how weak I really am? Making me understand how much I really need you? Is this why you're allowing this thorn of the flesh to continue there day after day? Of course, Paul wasn't stupid. He prayed. The Lord was able to remove that thorn. He said three times, remember the story? I pray three times and the Lord said this, my grace is sufficient for you. This is what you really need. Lord, what I really need is for you to remove this situation or carry it with me. And the Lord says, no, you're going to carry it on your own. But I'm going to be with you every step of the way. And He does this only to change us. You can rest, you can rest in His yoke. You can ask for the Holy Spirit to give you strength, to comfort you, to give you peace. And if you're going through trial right now, the Lord has not removed it. Even after a long time of praying, maybe He's wanting you to learn to rest on Him. That's want to remove your problem. That's who even want to carry it with you. But He wants to give you rest. I don't know about you, but this helps me a lot. It prepares me for the next trial. Let me just give you a few more verses and I'll close. Romans 8, 28, very famous, very well known verse. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord, to them who are called according to His purpose. All things. How many of you believe that? All things work together for good? What about Philippians 4.19? But my God shall supply all your needs according to His riches and glory by Jesus Christ. Of course, this is in the context. It's not that He'll provide everything. The Lord just provided. No, no. He says, You're, are you following through? Are you giving for missions? Are you giving so that uh, the, the, uh, for the advancement of the gospel? Yes. Then don't worry about your needs. God will take care of them. That's the context. Did you know that God has many names? You go in the Old Testament, you'll find many different names. One of the one, the, one that we like most is Jehovah Jireh. Am I pronouncing that correctly, Brother Tim? 
What does it mean? My Lord provides. But you know we have a better name than that. Father. Big bet. Father which are in heaven. Dig that even more. You can call the Lord the Almighty Sovereign God, Abba, Father. That changes everything. Of course, He is the God that can provide. Of course, He's the Almighty One that can do anything. But can you have a relationship with that one? But when we call Him Father, it changes everything. Remember, my kids, when they were going through trials. I would melt with when they come, Dad, Daddy, they call me Daddy. My son is 43 years, Gabriel, he still calls me Daddy. I, and I like it. <laughs> but I think he wants to keep it that way because he understands that I am his dad. That will never change. He's my little boy. He's my 43 year old little boy. And Adrian, two years younger. They can always call, and I can always relate. No matter how many times they failed me, how many times they sinned, they did the wrong things, they can always call me and say, Dad, I need, I need you. I need your help. Those wonderful Old Testament names are great, but I think the one that beats them all is Dad, Heavenly Father. So what do you do? when trials come. How do you handle those things that seem to be handling you now that have control over your reactions? Let me just go through the three points again. Have you taken your burdens to the right place? Fleeting or worry won't help you. Friends might not be able to help you. Fleeing, running away won't help you. Fighting back might not be the answer. But Dad, Father, Thus, he will help you. Then have your transfer, uh, transfer your burdens to the right person. He's the one that cares and can help in the situation. Remember that he can respond in different ways. He can remove your burden. Amen to that. But sometimes he decides to not remove it and he wants to relieve you. He wants to give you, he uh, wants to uh, carry it with you. That's only so that we can learn to have a close relationship with him, dependency. And then he'll just leave them there and give us the rest that we need in order to keep on, on, on with it. I don't know about you, but this helps me understand, uh, you know, where I'm supposed to be with the Lord. And it helps me at least have a scope so that next time something happens, I can kind of go through it. Is it going to help me to run away? I know what I'm doing, but it's a book, a holiday in Almeria or somewhere. You know, I need to get away. I'm so fed up. I need to leave this behind. You know what? You go wherever you go, it goes with you. <laughs> you need a vacation? Wonderful. Take it. But, you know, if you think you can leave your burdens over there in Almeria or whatever it is, you know, you're not going to, they're going to they're, they'll chase you every, every mile back home. Transfer your burdens to the right person and then trust your burdens to the right provisions. That, that means sometimes you will remove your burdens, sometimes you will relieve your burdens, sometimes you'll just simply give you the rest that you need. How do you handle what's handling you? Well, there it is. The Lord has the answer, and I hope we can apply it. Let's all stand and work. <clears throat> Father, what a privilege we have to be able to call you now Father in Heaven. It's hard to conceive, it's hard to understand who someone who is so mighty, so, uh, so out there that we, can, we can't hardly understand that he can reach out down to us and say, I want to be your father. And the way that happens is through the new birth. I'm so thankful, Lord, 43 years ago, I came to know you as my heavenly father. And of course, all those other titles we see in the Old Testament are true. 
But the one that seems, seems to ring in my ear most is the one we just mentioned now. Abba, Father, Daddy. How can we have a relationship with you so close to be able to call you Dad, Father? How can we uh, respond to trials in a better way than to come to you, Lord, and to uh, kind of cuddle up to your side and say, Lord, I don't know what you're, what's going on. The situation I'm going through seems to want to destroy me, destroy everything I've worked for. I don't really understand. I've tried everything in the book, everything that I've been recommended, but the problem's still there. And I don't know what to do. Well, Lord, we can come to you. We can rest on you. We can trust you with the problem. Whatever you're trying to do in our life, I pray that the, our response will be the correct one. It's not always remove the problem. And sometimes, as we saw this afternoon, you, not, you might not want to relieve. You might not want to kind of ease up the problem. But you want to create a dependency on you. You want, to, you want us to rest on you. And what that means, Lord, is that we need to trust you with whatever the situation we're going through. Air it out, bring it to you, talk to you about it. Thank you, even thank you for it. And then get up and keep moving, trying to understand what you're trying to do. I pray that this afternoon and this one here who has been going through trials and there's been confusion, not understanding what's going on, that maybe this message can help. I pray, Lord, that you'll help us register this, the, these lessons in our heart. Because although right now we might not be going through any trials, tomorrow might be different. You guarantee your word that in this world we will suffer affliction. It doesn't say we might suffer affliction. It says we will. And so, Lord, when that does come, help us handle the situation in a God-honoring way. Help me, dear Lord, be able to respond well in every situation I might be, see myself in. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.